I, so I didn't plan to do this. He just asked me before the meeting. So um, we, if you've been to some of these meetups in the last few months, uh, the, the speakers are, were asked to have a few slides about ransomware, what it is. And so you've probably seen all those before. Uh, but that was all very theoretically, and some of it was not quite correct. So I thought about doing actually a presentation with a demo. Uh, but then the dates didn't work out, and I, I, I forgot about it. Um, so but two weeks ago, one of the companies I worked with, the, it's a software company, and the boss there asked me what I'm doing. And I thought, I said, I may be doing a presentation on ransomware. And he had no idea what that was. So he was the, the technical lead of that. Uh, that company. So Wednesday I went back into that company and suddenly he had heard about ransomware because it was, a, it was everywhere. Last weekend, uh, WannaCry happened and so now he was interested. So yesterday, well, so first day, I spent some time on putting on, uh, putting uh, this presentation together just to show who the 20 people in his company. Uh, so I just found this on my phone. So. Um, can talk a little bit about this. So I think the, the first few things are malware attack vectors, then ransomware especially compared to other ones, then what is WannaCry and what we can do to protect ourselves. Uh, the problem with the demos are that I, I don't have my virtual machines where I prepared the demos, but I can talk a little bit what I've done and what I've shown and you have to believe me. Um, so in general, I think most of these things are uh, you know about anyway. So how does malware get onto our PCs? Usually through the person who sits in front of the screen. So while in the back, in the, in the past, people tried to attack our networks from the outside, get through, and it was more easy. Now people get to peop the, the hackers get to people inside, usually through email or through a messenger service to send attachments and trick them into opening them. Um, so they open the link and then I don't know how stupid you can be to, I mean download okay, but if it's an executable, actually double click on it to open it. But we have to understand that a lot of people are not technical and there's a lot of people who are not technical working with computers, so people do that and it happens all the time and we've seen that last weekend. Um, the thing about finding this USB, USB stick outside, um, or people give you USB sticks at uh, conferences as a freebie, so you put that in and then you're owned by everybody, so no, don't do that. Um, I don't know whether we heard about the Microsoft Essential, Security Essential slash Defender problem that came out like two weeks ago, where there was a vulnerability in the engine in all the modern Microsoft systems, where if a file was opened that was specially crafted, it took over your machine, which is bad enough on a client. But on server 2016, which may run on Azure, whatever, or at least in the future, if, if anybody uploads this file, the first thing before your website actually downloads, uh, like uses it, the, the antivirus engine kicks in and looks at the file, and then your server's already owned. So that's pretty bad. And if you run 2016, make sure that you have your latest version of that. Uh, and other antivirus, antivirus software also introduces new problems in your system. So I usually don't use any additional products, but um, now that they come in Windows, I keep them on as well. So this one I stole from a Microsoft one. So it's just visualize a little bit what happens. So they attack, they usually go in through the user, phishing attacks whatsoever. As soon as they get onto the device, they download additional things. Uh, so they make sure that they, they can stay on the device. And then they try to spread through the network. And then usually they, they own you. So that means your business is disrupti dis disrupted. Um, People have to deal with this thing, so you lost productivity. They can steal data. They can do espionage. And in some cases, they do ransom, which brings us to the next one. What's special about ransomware? 
How is it different compared to normal malware? What normal malware, a lot of times, they put ads on your machine. They are used to take over your machine to attack other machines, like botnets who attack websites or whatever. Ransomware is different as um, rather than sitting in the back and doing, well, maybe do something. They look at all your important files and encrypt them. Usually you use very strong encryption, AES-256, which is something that we at the moment cannot break. So if it's encrypted and you don't have the key, you're kind of stuck, you're, you're out there. So, uh, and depends on how smart they are. It turns out that WannaCry wasn't actually that smart. Apparently it only looked at like my documents and certain things. But the first thing you would do, you go through all the drives on the computer, find all the important files, um, and then later on go on to the network. Um, in terms of developers, they could find like your source code. They, if they're really smart, I would do getting into your repositories on Git or whatever and connect them and then ideally delete things that are already in your repository. So I don't think that happens yet. So I, I, I actually, I, I've never actually looked at the code oh. for one of them, but the ones, the one I wrote, uh, spoiler alert, uh, I just looked at sp uh, sp specific extensions. Okay. Uh, but I mean, they are obviously the extension that everybody knows, but you could also be more smart and actually look at the content and see is this worth encrypting. But there's lots of different, uh, different versions that do different things. So usually the only way you can get your files back is pay the ransom in bitcoins usually. It turned out for WannaCry, it wasn't very, very well written ransomware because they, the encryption key was still in memory until you rebooted your machine. So recently it came out that uh, they, they, are, they have freeware programs now that look into that specific part of memory to get the, the, crypt, the encryption key and then get your files back. So these were actually amateurs. They're just really lucky that they got out very widely distributed. The total ransomware they paid uh, not into their Bitcoin wallet was like almost uh, 40, 40 or 50,000. Well, that's not very much considering 200,000 machines. Most people didn't pay. Uh, so quickly, Oops, something missed. How do I go back on the Mac? Oh, this one. Ah, there it is. So I didn't know the first ransomware was in 1989. You knew that? Yes. Did you write it? OK. So I kind of heard about it in 2013 when CryptoLocker came out uh, and took over, well, so that was, I think, the first a bit more widespread one that people got affected with. I think I remember something, uh, some virus where it encrypts the JPEG file. So yeah, I don't remember what they were called. Usually, they even if they encrypted things, but they didn't get the ransom. Because the problem with ransom is, nowadays we have Bitcoin. How would you actually get uh, your money out of them, right? So send me something into my bank account. That doesn't work so well. So. So d you can deposit like this bag of notes over there at that corner. So that doesn't work either. So now with Bitcoin, it makes it actually possible on a wide scale to get money out. Um, so there's different versions. And it was kind of clear when this happened that we will have a problem in the future. And so WannaCry happened last week. This is what that looks like. And I see one problem is, I think, even though now there is Bitcoin, a lot of people who are not keeping their computers up to date don't know what that is and don't know how to get them. And it's actually not that easy, I think. I, I never bothered to get my own. So I may actually look into that a little bit. But to get the money, so what they do is, if you don't pay in three days, we double the ransom. And if you don't pay in seven days, that's it. We, we don't give you any decryption files. 
Uh, I think yesterday they actually sent additional messages to the people who are affected to really, really please them to pay, because so far they didn't get so much money, even though they got a lot of publicity. Um, so this is what this one looks like. Uh, so a little bit about the history. So the ransomware itself that they use is not so smart, and it's been around for a while. But as you may know, uh, let me go through. So the NSA developed a whole bunch of uh, attacks to spy on people. And then last summer, they got hacked by this hackers group, the shadow brokers. And they stole a lot of the stuff. And they tried to sell it to other hackers, but nobody actually offered them money. So eventually, I think in March or in February, or in April, I'm not sure. Um, they just released all the NSA stuff to the public internet. So Microsoft then in March patched some of the things, most of the things. Um, but people now got the code from the NSA, including this thing called Internal Blue, which is using an SMB 1.0 problem that has been around for a long time. Uh, and, and I think in modern Windows versions that's turned off because we have SMB 3.0. But older versions of Windows still have that. And that's the reason why most computers that were infected were XP computers, because uh, they haven't been patched. And they were still running the same SMB 1.0 they ran in 2002 or whatever. And a lot of these were things that, let me see, uh, vendor machines, ATMs, and hospital equipments manufacturing machines. So not like your typical PC on your desktop, but things in, in the industry that it's also not so easy to replace them. So if you have an ATM running, you don't every year replace it with a new one. And some of the hospital machines that run complex software, apparently some of the vendors who did the software are out of business. So they're very happy that things still runs. And it costs like millions to port it onto a new system, mobile new systems. So you cannot really blame them for still running XP. Um, and the problem is. That's the irony, right? It's Imagine like this. See, you have a live staging device that's running on a Windows XP. You have a desktop that runs on Windows 10. Right? So uh, the, the real irony is that the manufacturer who actually need to have an adaptation on the technology part because no one can write a fantastic code in 20 years before or 10 years before, no one even knows that these threads exist when they wrote the code. Right? So when someone finds a vulnerability, it is better to share, but it's not shared for obvious political reasons. You know, the industry should adapt. Uh, the provider, provider, say Microsoft, asks you to, there's no support for XP anymore. Right? So there's a reason why it was done like that, because there's no more money being spent on fixing Windows XP, or because it's already old, we are already having a newer uh, uh, OS. So the manufacturer should have a you know much more aligned path towards. Uh, Maybe I ask a question. So obviously, I'm not not affected by this, so I can ask this question. How did one crack get into the system? Okay, I think in most cases, it's, uh, I see on the next slide again. Can we talk about that? Um, I just follow up. I don't know. Um, so a lot of people say, if you use XP, put it in the VM. Don't put it on the network. But the problem is, if it runs your, your ATM or your machine or so, you cannot do that. You have to have like special hardware interfaces that connect with all your other equipment. So the, the main problem is, why are these machines connected to some other parts of the network that were connected to the internet or connected to normal users? Your barcode or your uh, your anti-spam should 
Actually, it's going to break out. So, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a very complex situation. And one thing, uh, one thing what we really realize is that it's become much, much more complex here than uh, like few years ago. So you have to follow not only just the patching and everything, you actually need to see into all your entry points and look for uh, mitigative tasks right from your group policy. You have to work a whole lot of things to, you know, to increase or to, to, to decrease your attack surface. So there's nothing like, oh, uh, I can build a firewall for 100% proof. No one, need even, no one even can log in. Right? I can write a, we can give a very good firewall that no one can log in. No one can break it. But what is the purpose of it? Yeah. So I think it's, uh, it's going to be complex for the information security professionals going forward. And One well, some of the, the main example was the hospitals in the UK. There was the, the German railway system. Uh, all the big railway stations have display monitors to show all the, the trains leaving and arriving, and they all had that red uh, ransomware thing. And so these are running XP, and they don't all they do is show a browser window or like in a kiosk mode to show these things. And why were they connected to someone who clicked on an email? Right, so that's the question. But on the other hand, you just re-image that computer, and then you don't pay the ransom because there were no data on there. So um, let me see what's next. Okay, so Windows 10 itself was not affected by this internal blue problem because it's new and it has been patched anyway. But if you download WannaCry onto Windows 10, it still decrypts your data. It just means because Windows, like Microsoft says, so people say, ah, oh, Windows 10, you're safe. But if you click on that email, on the attachment, and download and execute it, you're still owned. It's just that this particular thing that went through the network layer to get onto your machine wouldn't get to your machine. But uh, so Windows 10 is not completely safe. On a Mac, right now, you are OK, because nobody has written a Mac version of it. But if you download your email and uh, some executable and double click it on a, or one click it on a Mac, you still get your files to, uh, encrypted. So just because you're using a Mac doesn't mean um, you're safe. On a phone, we haven't seen many things like that because most of the time people don't store a lot of files on their phone. And if that, if that they have a copy somewhere else. So I think it's not the, the purpose or the, the value can, you can get out of phones at the moment. I, I don't think it's that as, as big as on our PC. So look at the same thing in terms of WannaCry. So they still get in through email, usually uh, some sort of attachment, and targeting attacks certain people. I don't know why they would target people in hospitals. I think there was, there was more random luck or un unlucky to get there. So as soon as they got out there, they put um, the eternal blue. And then there's this another thing that came from the NSA, NSA called the double pulsar backdoor. So they got into their system, and from there, then they attacked other things through the SMB vulnerability on other computers. So they only needed one entry point to get uh, in there. So at this point, I think I did a demo uh, where I used the Windows 10 machine to try to download some, so I cannot show the demo now. Uh, so I looked around, and I found some ransomware. There's some ransomware on GitHub you can look at. Um, so I tried to download that. So an Edge. The smart screen technology wouldn't even let me download it. You can turn that off. And then it behaves in the same way as Google or Fi as Chrome or Firefox. But as soon as you save it onto your drive, uh, the, the defender that is in Windows 10 deleted it straight away. So I couldn't even look at things. Um, so for a demo, I wanted to show how it works. So I wrote my own. It's just uh, something I did in C Sharp. I, because it's using the the .NET security classes in the, in, the, in the framework. So I use AES-256 to load a file, encrypt it, and save it back. Um, so my version is just a simple command line tool. I give it a directory and a certain extension wildcard. So it encrypts only certain files that I know. I want it to be safe. Um, and then it goes through and uh, 
recursively direct, like loops through all the directories and files and encrypts them all. Uh, and then there's no way to get them back. So, and then at the end, there's a message showing what it does. And Windows 10 let it go all at what I want to do. So that shows that even now, with the latest OSs and the latest patches, if you get that thing onto your system and it's new, you're still affected. Well, the, the one thing you could do is, as of antivirus, is that if there's a program that loops for all your files and then does something with all these files, there are some cases that that's yeah, legit. Windows Advanced Threat Protection Program but actually does that. Windows ATP actually does your signature. When the first time that you do, if you have an ATP subscription, whatever you did, you will not be able to do it a second time. So okay. uh, Windows ATP is already having the same one. I think it's a, uh, I just want to set the context. Any virus, anyone, someone, I, I'm, a, I'm a guy who actually tried to write the first one, for example. Uh, I write a very sneaky one, and I want to pass it to you using a, a SD card, for example. Mm -hmm. How do you use it? You put an SD card and it works. Hey, uh, next one, some of the pictures I want to share it with you, and it, it opens the back door with me. The first time, it actually does. And no one can stop the first time. I know. Yeah. Right? Any, uh, irrespective of the OS, irrespective of Windows or anything. Until it learns, until your antivirus program or anti-malware learns what it is, uh, that's the that's that's the way it works uh, in today's world. So, uh, idea is someone uh, the signature is getting picked up by the engine as soon as possible. Once it is done, uh, trying to protect the others. But <coughs> that's a premium level security. So at this point of time, Microsoft gives the ATP, which is actually a price. Not a free web. Windows uh, runs on top of the Windows Defender. Yeah. So I tried. I tried to apply for the trial, and they wouldn't let me. Yeah. Uh, there is some restriction. Even I yes. didn't get it. Huh. But the question is, like, uh, how does ATP will detect your genuine code and the same? Because it has a signature capturing mechanism. Uh, Windows Defender has a uh, auto submission of the signature. Uh, you can toggle. So in, uh, in the slides they used to show here at the meetings, there was one entry saying turn on file history in Windows 10. So if I do that in my demo and then update my files, so and then I run my, my ransomware again, the whole file encryption, the file history folder was completely encrypted as well. So that, that didn't help at all because the problem is that the file history folder on a different drive is accessible to the current user with right permissions. So my, my ransomware can also just go there and encrypt everything. So that's not, if you want to do backups, um, so always have backups anyway. Uh, and ideally you want to have backups that are not accessible to your current locked in user. Um, be careful what you click, always. Um, just because an email comes from someone that you know, that doesn't mean that that person sent you something. Uh, so if you don't expect anything, if you give him a call or chat back to him and say like, is this from you? What do I do with it? Uh, and do not pay. So talk, talk to friends and family, right? Even though they wouldn't understand. Now they know they've heard about it because it wasn't the news. Storage was vulnerable because he was mapped into his local server. 
and it got the encrypted as well. So okay. that you you it's better to secure your storage also. Yeah, some of the some of the mail uh, some of the ransomware waits a few days. Uh, well, so it starts encrypting, then it waits a few days before it shows the the pop up to pay me money. So that means that the the encrypted files are remitted into your last night's and previous night's backup. So um, on my personal systems, I made sure that I have even if I have a, I have external hard drives and I have internal hard drives that copy every hour but that my normal user has no write access to those backup files. I can still read from it, but I can never write to it. Um, so this is a little bit more what can uh, admins do. So obviously backups even more important. Um, so one thing you could do is, because right now in Windows at least, a user can only write into its, his or her own directory. Not, no more Windows, no more program files like in the past. So if you also say that we're using NTFS permissions, the home directory. Sorry, uh, anyone can identify a program. I can give you uh, some special whatever uh, I can get from the store. I think here, Microsoft, I can give uh, one person who answers for it. What are, what is the, can you name one application that runs on the home drive, like home directory? I, can, I can do. You're using every day, not, not you. Because I tried that, and then I figured out all the things that won't run anymore. If I do this, there's a certain things that don't run. But well, especially if you use Windows 10 apps, like modern apps, UWP. But uh, okay, so is someone else who can think of something? Uh, yeah, the application developers when uh, user profile. They start sorry, user profile. Sorry, no, user profile. No, I'm talking about coming to program. Uh, so the, what happened is when admin started start removing admin access for user. So when the, the developers found a way to circumvent, okay, let's put everything on a home directory where they have a full access, and then start running everything from there. And that is the, in, the dustbin. That is where you get most of your infection start from. I like almost 99% of the infection start from your uh, the home directory because that is the way, uh, that's the easy place to store any malware or anything because you already have a full access, I don't have to do an escalation privilege. So I just need to exploit you. I need to click you one link or something, and then I use your home drive. Yeah. Microfile so can make it? Like no. no. C user app data, local. Yeah, anywhere in your user directory, you can you can write Google and you can execute. Google Chrome. Right. Google Chrome, if you have, don't have a local privilege, it actually goes into your home directory. Yeah, so it installs the whole Chrome in there. And if you have 100 users on the machine, you have 100 Chromes. But there's, lo there's lots of other things. Um, so you can only do this with users. OK, these are like free programs. They're all installed in program files. And they're only safe. So the, the virus will then go here and s save itself into your home directory, but it cannot execute. Uh, I forgot about what I meant by this. But there's always risks you should look at. Uh, is there anything in particular that you can look at? Patch everything um, and educate users. The last two, not specifically for ransomware, but a good way anyway. Never run as admin and use always the lowest pri privileges you can get away with. Let's see. So the second, let me think. Uh, OK, this is a little bit what I already talked about. So I looked into some things that the enterprise version of Windows can give us to prevent running executables. So there's AppLocker, there's Device Guard in Windows 10. And they kind of redefine these are the three applications that can run on this machine. Uh, and there's different, um, different levels of s strengths or like restrictions that you can apply to it. But it's not super easy to set up. Um, and so I think what I did, uh, we talked about setting just file permissions of this. So I did all this, and then I wrote a PowerShell version of my ransomware. And I run that. And um, because it PowerShell was still enabled for every user, so the script ran and then encrypted everything again. So what you also have to do, if you can, Disable PowerShell and like scripting, Windows scripting host for all the users. 
that is a problem if you want to run some scripts. So there's always like, you can lock it down completely, but then you're safer, but then you cannot do anything. Um, so I did that, well, which, which are demos, which I crossed them out because yesterday I didn't want to show them. Um, and I, I showed a way how I do my backups to get to make sure that they cannot be affected. Um, and we already talked about this to make sure that any location on your hard drive you can either write into or you can run things from, never both. So if you want to install new software, then use a different account to write into it. Uh, so Windows got a lot better about that, but the home directory is still the last bit where you can do both. Um, so what I, knew, what I do, um, macros, okay, PDFs, it's a different problem. So I, three things I can remember, do I have them here? Okay, so in Chrome, the way I'm using it to browse is I, I have a separate user on my system that can not execute anywhere on my hard drives. It can write files. So I use the command line to start Chrome under this account. And then even though Chrome has to write like temporary files somewhere, it can never execute anything. So this is the Chrome browser I use for browsing to sites where I don't know, I don't know what happens. Um, PDFs is every time I download a PDF, I run it through a Python script that goes through the whole PDF code and disables any Java and Action script that may be in there. So if there's anything in there, then after that, it, it wouldn't run anymore. But it leaves the actual content alone. Um, and then I showed how to disable PowerShell for certain users, but not others. Okay. That's what I had. The problem is, if you run powershell.exe slash bypass, or you can set the execution policy on the call on PowerShell. Mm -hmm. So I know you can do that, but if, if you just run the script, it wouldn't work. But if you run the PowerShell with the slash bypass execution policy, you can still run um, unsigned. So it's, it's a nice thing to have, but it's only a little step. So it's not enough. Anything else? So if you have like a, a OneDrive sync client, right? Um, I'm not actually sure about OneDrive, whether they keep separate versions of doc documents. I think, I mean, Google does. Uh, no, so the question? The I think if you, if you have a repository like Git, um, usually af as soon as you submit it and commit it and push it into the repository, uh, they're kind of safe. But I think there are even commands to delete things uh, back into history. So I, I never, uh, one time I had to try, but so I don't know. This, these people will get smarter and smarter. So if, if you think you're safe because you're using something like that, I mean, if having a file history in the cloud should be okay, but it may also be tricky to actually get thousands of files back. Because I don't know whether, maybe you can right click on the file and say, I want a previous version. But if I have a thousand of them, I don't know whether the API support doing that. So having local backups, I mean, it depends how depend dependable on, your, on the cloud you are in your company, right? So if you have all the documents in SharePoint, I'm actually not sure. I haven't, 
I haven't worked on the SharePoint environment for a while, but I can imagine that uh, it's probably safer in the cloud than having your local SharePoint server. If that would be affected no. and don't have good backups. So one thing I tried when I, when I looked at my backups and make sure that my local backups cannot be uh, affected by ransomware, I thought about my backup process is actually copying files using Robocopy or something from one drive to another. In that process, making sure that the files that are copied are not encrypted. So for example, if I, if I have a docx or Word document, I can make sure that's a zip file that I can open as part of my backup process. And if it's not a zip file anymore, then I know it has been encrypted. So I'm, I'm not copying that into my backup. So I think that like commercial backup solutions will come up with things that... Uh, um, no, it's already no? there. It's already uh, there. Azure storage, you can use Azure storage to have it encrypted, the storage itself. And you can enable Azure Packer authentication on Azure. Uh, currently, there is general availability. You can actually make use of it for uh, protecting your uh, storage. It's already available. But you're not using ba Azure as your backup? Uh, yeah, Azure agent as your backup okay. um, on-prem. It covers a variety of workloads, whatever, in VM or in on-prem, laptop. And they make sure that the file is not encrypted? How would yeah. they know that? My file actually goes and talks to a storage unit container. That container is already encrypted with my tenant uh, secure ID. Yeah, but uh, it doesn't matter. So if, if, some, if, if the ransomware encrypts your file. No, it doesn't matter. My, run, my storage cannot be accessed to anything except my Yeah, but now, 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 on your local machine, the ransomware encrypted your file. Hmm. So the, the the we're talking about the backup, right? Securing the backup. The yeah, but securing the backup. I understand that uh, it's en it's encrypted on the on the Azure side, but the web, what I'm saying is like the backup software before it copies it, the agent looks at the file and makes sure that it's not affected by ransomware. Before it actually, because if a copy is over, then it's encrypted on the other side. It doesn't matter how safe it is on the other side. No, the but backup process, I don't think the ransomware goes into the backup process. Uh, of course, if the file is uh, already, say, for example, my C drive uh, desktop is already encrypted, yeah. using one, one drive already encrypted, the backup process will actually migrate the encrypted data only. Before that, it won't be encrypting, uh, it won't be sending the encryption data. That is a different layer that we're talking about. What are we talking about? The security on the storage, the backup that I keep. Yeah, I don't. I, t I talk about a process within the backup software to say, okay, I'm not copying this file anywhere because it has been affected by ransomware. Yeah. And I don't think that exists yet, but that's something that I will see coming. Right. Anything yeah. else? It's not turned on in Windows 10 or server. So that's just the way that they spread so much. Because they, they stole the NSA tool, and then they knew, OK, we can affect a lot of old people, like old computers. But that's, that's NTLM. La manager version yeah. one, different from SMB. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So we need to move on, I guess.
ব্যবসার 